Amen. Well, we are continuing our sermon series in the Divine Conspiracy. I hope you've been reading it. Um, I told a lot of you that chapter one is the hardest chapter, and I hope that, uh, that you don't think I was lying, uh, because it does get uh, progressively uh, easier. But let me provide a recap of what we talked about last week. The theme of last week and the theme with which he opened up this book was the idea that um, many people in the world are flying upside down because they do not have an adequate basis or instrument upon which they can base their life and make right and proper decisions. And that's because many people believe that the world is uh, um, not a, gr a world that's saturated by God, but it's a world that just popped into existence. And in such a world, how can you find meaning? Yet, in spite of the fact that people believe that, we still desire meaning. We still crave a life that makes a difference, right? And so Willard is trying to help us uh, understand how it is that Jesus Christ comes to inject meaning into a world that has tried to suck all the meaning out, out of the world. We also talked about how it's the, uh, the idea systems, the power of mere ideas that govern the way people think, the things people do, the way people act. We saw that power this past Wednesday, did we not? If you're looking for an example of how ideas work, the people that stormed the Capitol building, why did they storm it? An idea. See, that's how ideas work. It's a perfect illustration of how ideas captivate the mind and then lead the body to act and, beh and behave in certain ways. That can be true of ideas that are uh, grounded in reality and ideas that are not grounded in reality. Whatever the idea is, if it governs the mind powerfully enough, it will lead people to act and behave, to think and do certain things, to become certain kinds of people. And so this past week, as I was watching all the coverage, it hit me stronger than ever that since this is the case, since we're witnessing before us how impactful ideas are and how, how ideas govern the, the ways that we live our lives, how much more important is it that the ideas of God's kingdom are the ones that we're bringing into the world, the ones that we're presenting to people to listen to, to be captivated by, to believe. As Dallas Willard says, there's no avo avoiding the fact that we live at the mercy of our, of our ideas. We live at the mercy of our ideas. And this is never more true than with our ideas about God. So as we study this book, I, I really want you to think that what we're doing is engaging in a battle of ideas not ideas that will just kind of stay in your mind, but they won't impact your body, they won't impact your lives, but these are ideas about the way you live your lives on, on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis, so that you can live a life that's properly rooted in reality, that helps you flourish in the way that God uh, created you to, uh, to flourish, because that's what Jesus came to announce. And so this week, we're going to look at the gospel. We're going to look at the the main idea system that Jesus came to bring when he came uh, to earth uh, a little over 2,000 years ago. And we're going to ask ourselves the question, um, what is that gospel that Jesus came to bring? And why did that gospel have such an impact in Jesus' day, but it doesn't seem to have the same impact in our day? As we talked about last week, the gospel that Jesus came to bring was nothing other than the availability of the kingdom of God, right? Right? And what's the kingdom of God? Well, the kingdom of God is the place where God reigns. It's the place where what God wants done is done. It's not a physical kingdom that we can travel to, but it's an invisible kingdom. It's a kingdom whose reign depends upon those who surrender to that kingdom. Therefore, we can all enter the kingdom right now by choosing to surrender to that kingdom. God's kingdom as we discussed in Sharon's class this past Wednesday, it's actually nearer to each and every one of us than the air we're breathing right now. So to turn into God's kingdom that's available, all it requires of someone is to say, I want to enter. 
I surrender, or yes, I repent, I turn, I want to be part of God's kingdom. That's the good news that Jesus was making available to people, that you guys, wherever you're living, no matter what your lives look like right now, you can become a resident of the kingdom of God and live with the power of God that will enable you to have the kind of life that you see in me, the abundant life. But as I say, that invitation has diminished. The message of Jesus has diminished a little bit. We know it's diminished because if it were the same message and the same idea system, the results would also be the same. But the results aren't the same, and the reason for that is because the gospel that's now preached by and large in many churches on the right and churches on the left and churches in between is a gospel that has life excluded from it. What do I mean by that? I mean, it's a gospel that focuses on something that's going to happen after we die. Which I was teaching a class yesterday where uh, people were sharing their testimonies, and almost 75% of the testimonies, someone told a story of going to a Christian meeting or something like that, and the pastor stands up and gives the altar call and says something like, um, if a bus hit you today, I don't know why it's always a bus, you know, but if a bus hit you today and you were to die, where would you go? See, that gospel points to what? What happens after I die? So it, it, it entirely excludes the life that I'm right now living, you know? And so the gospels that are being presented focus on, um, they don't focus on the the. The, the human need that's dominating our lives right now. Rather, they point our attention to something that may happen uh, in the afterlife. And a result of that, a result of that idea and that message being preached is that we have many conversions. We have a lot of churches. If you drive down the street uh, about a mile and a half into, into uh, Hartwell or Carthage, you'll see so many churches that are no longer open. There's one neighborhood where you can literally see five churches within a one block um, distance. Many churches, many conversions, little impact on the culture. Why? Why is this the case? Well, it's the case because of the message that we're preaching. It's the case because of the ideas that are coming from pulpits around the world. Because it's those ideas that people hear and believe. And if I hear and believe a message that says, if you believe in Jesus, you'll go to heaven when you die, then I'm going to place my confidence in something that will happen when? After I die. But what confidence will I have in Christ right now? You see, it's because of what we're doing, which, which begins with what we teach. And many churches, as I said, both on the right and on the left, teach a gospel of Jesus that has nothing to do with day-to-day -day life. It's all about managing sin of some sort. So let's look at what uh, Willard says about the gospel on the right. He says the gospel on the right is all about being a Christian, uh, having your sins forgiven. If you read the chapter, he, would have, he mentioned the, um, the bumper sticker that says, uh, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. Who's heard that before? Okay, a few people have heard it. Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. And in, if, if you attend one of these churches, you'll realize that since they're emphasizing uh, placing your trust in Christ so you can go to heaven when you die, the things that they push is right belief. You have to believe a certain uh, number of truths correctly in order that you can go to heaven when you die. This is why they focus a lot on the creeds and believing the creeds. This is why they emphasize attending Bible studies, so that you can get uh, your, your thought process. You can believe the right things. If you take the test for membership or for baptism, you can say, yes, I believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in God the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. They have to emphasize belief because they attach belief to the transaction that if I just believe the right things about God, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, then my name will be written down in the book of life. And then when I die, someone in heaven is going to open up that book. He's going to look through all the K's, 
and then he's going to say Meshach Canyon, right? They have to emphasize belief because forgiveness and eternal destiny for them is the entirety of the gospel. Salvation is all about when you go after you die, where you go after you die. But you see, if you read the gospels, you'll see that Jesus actually didn't emphasize belief as much as many churches emphasize. He certainly emphasized it, and he certainly said that belief has its place. But what Jesus emphasized the most is belonging. He emphasized relationship. When people came to him, he didn't give them a pop quiz. In fact, if you, if you look at the way that um, rabbis accepted disciples, most rabbis would give their disciples a quiz to see if they already had a working knowledge of stuff that they should believe accurately. And so the disciples would come to rabbis in that day and say to the rabbi, can I be your disciple? And then the rabbi would say, well, why don't you go ahead and quote the book of uh, Leviticus for me? Why don't you tell me what the, the, uh, the laws of Moses are? And if the students could answer those questions correctly, the rabbi would say, you can come and be my disciple. But what did Jesus do? Jesus sought out people, and he didn't ask any questions about what they believed. But he sought them out in order that he can be with them. You see, he emphasized relationship over belief. In fact, if you look in John chapter 10, there's a part where uh, the Pharisees are refusing to believe who Jesus says he is. And listen to what Jesus said to them. He said, the works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe. Why? Because you are not among my sheep. In other words, the reason you don't believe, Jesus says, is because you don't belong. He emphasizes relationship. Because if the relationship is there, the belief will come. I can't hang out with Jesus without believing that he's the son of God. But if I try to force someone to believe that he's the son of God without hanging out with him, that belief won't have any substance. But this is what you see propagated in many churches on the right. They emphasize belief in order that your destiny when you die can be secured. Meanwhile, Jesus is emphasizing relationship. I mean, think about that passage. You do not believe because you're not a part of my sheep. If, if, you, if you analyze what Jesus is saying here and consider the kind of relationship that a sheep has with the shepherd, what are we picturing? We're picturing a relationship that is dependent, right? Because sheep are dependent on the shepherd for food, for safety, for everything they need to live. And this is what Jesus is saying that life with him looks like. It's a relationship that leads to belief, not belief that leads to a relationship. So many churches have it just flipped around the wrong way. The approach that Jesus is suggesting impacts the kind of life one has now. It'll certainly impact the life one has later on. I mean, if you're a friend of God now, when you die, do you think that Jesus would say, but did you, uh, did you confess that I am? No. He'd say, we've been hanging out all, all the while on earth. Come on in, man. Heaven's a wonderful place. Abraham, as Willard pointed out, was called a friend of God. Now, when Abraham placed his faith in God, did that mean that God said, oh, good, now you go to heaven when you die? No, it didn't mean that at all. See, we, we emphasize heaven so much, and we emphasize forgiveness so much, but those things are easy for God. Let me, let me say something that might shock some of you. Jesus didn't die so that your sins could be forgiven. That's not why Jesus was crucified. Because if you notice, Jesus was forgiving people's sins before he was crucified, wasn't he? If you remember the story of Jesus preaching and then people opened up the roof, what did he say to the paralyzed man that they lowered down? He said, son, your sins are forgiven. When, when they brought the woman that was accused of adultery, what did Jesus say to her when, when all the accusers left, when he was riding down the dirt? He said, your sins are forgiven. Jesus didn't die on the cross so that your sins could be forgiven. 
He was already forgiving sins. Jesus didn't die on the cross so you can go to heaven when you die. It's his house. He can let anyone in who wants to be there. Why did Jesus die? Jesus died to release us from the power that leads us to commit sins so that the lives that we live can be lived in the freedom of the kingdom so that we can live the kind of lives that he created us to live. He died because we were in bondage. He didn't die so we can say, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. Forgiveness is easy for God. But he came because he wanted us to have the eternal kind of life that's available for us in the kingdom of God. But when we take the message to just mean that Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven, what we'll be saying is that God actually isn't interested in our day-to-day lives, just our final destination. This is like uh, sending your kids to college and only being interested in them graduating in four years. But any parent that loves their child is certainly interested in the kind of person they're becoming while they're at college, right? For what good would it be to go to the college graduation and see that your child uh, was the valedictorian, but they're also a serial killer, right? That wouldn't make me happy as a parent. I mean, I think that kind of diminished the joy I had about becoming a valedictorian. So God is interested in the kind of lives that we lead right now. But since the gospel on the right focuses on forgiveness, it leaves us with churches who are filled with members who are, for the most part, indistinguishable in their character and moral development from people on the outside because they can rest assured that I've already completed the divine transaction, therefore when I die, I'm going to go to the good place and not the bad place. Well, what about the gospel on the left? Well, the gospel on the left says this, being a Christian means having a significant commitment to the elimination of social or structural evils. Now, this gospel uh, correctly sees that God stands on the side of people who are oppressed. And that's true. You look in the Bible, whenever people are oppressed, God is with them. And in Exodus, it says that when the children of Israel cried out to them, God heard and God knew. God hates oppression. Anytime God sees his children being oppressed for anything, God hates oppression. And we should hate oppression too. So the view on the left correctly sees that God is against oppression. So if we, if we try to compare them, the right emphasizes uh, faith and belief. The left, because God emphasizes, uh, because God is against oppression, the, the view on the left, theological left that is, emphasizes love. But on the left, the love of God is expressed through eliminating these social and structural evils, but it falls short of what God's love really means, right? All it is is a love that means people shouldn't be oppressed. But God's love says a lot more than people shouldn't be oppressed. Let's take the uh, children of Israel, for example, again. When God freed Israel from Egypt, what did he set them free to do? Not to just wander in the wilderness and do whatever the heck they wanted to do, right? Liberty wasn't God's goal. The kind of freedom that God brings to people who are oppressed is a freedom from their captives in order that they can become his children. So it's going from one master to the other master. But the gospel on the left just says people shouldn't be oppressed. Therefore, the job of the church is to fight against oppression in whatever way it presents itself. So in this understanding of what it means to fight against oppression, the, the, the view of the, the left theologically sees love as the main thing. And, if, and love means setting people free who are being oppressed in order that they can express their desires and live the kind of lives that they want to live. Therefore, what they actually do doesn't matter as long as they have the freedom to do it without the oppressive thumb of some, of some ruler overlording them 
forcing them to be, do, think, and act in ways that the oppressive ruler wants. The obvious example of this is the ongoing debate right now in the United Methodist Church and in other uh, denominations about human sexuality, right? The left-leaning churches want to affirm human sexuality in whatever form it presents itself. And therefore, it fights against any idea that would suggest that people shouldn't act on their desires. Freedom, liberty, right? But this view on the left, it misunderstands how God is on the side of the oppressed. Let me say it again. God doesn't set us free to do whatever we want. He sets us free so that we can live in relationship with him because he understands why it is that he created us and the kind of good life he has for us. Therefore, he sets us free to obey him. True freedom doesn't come with liberty in the same way that if you, if you liberate a tree from the bondage of the ground, what's going to happen to the tree? It's going to die. Oh, the tree will say, but now I can go wherever I want to go for a while. True freedom that God brings liberates the tree from the ground in which it's contained and plants it within the ground in which it can bring forth much more fruit. So the gospel on the left, it excludes God from actual life just as much as the gospel on the right does. And these are the two gospels. If you look back at church history in America for the last hundred years, these are the two gospels that have been dominant in our, in our culture. You'll go to heaven when you die, fight against social and structural evils. Now, I hasten to say this. Both of those gospels have an element of the truth. God does forgive our sins. God does hate oppression. Christians should be involved in work that eliminates oppressions. Christians should be preaching that your sins can be forgiven, but that's not the entirety of the gospel. In fact, I'd suggest to you that that's not even the main point of the, of the gospel, of the real gospel, the gospel that Jesus came to bring. You see, neither right nor left lays down a coherent framework that leads to life in the kingdom of God emphasized by the New Testament. They both have very little to say about the day-to-day -day experience of life in the world in which we live, and therefore the gospel becomes irrelevant. I was talking to a friend uh, last Sunday, um, and he mentioned that one of the reasons uh, one of his family members doesn't go to church is because she feels like it's wholly irrelevant. And with sadness, I said to her, I understand, I said to him, I understand. I understand why somebody would say that. Because if I'm hearing a message about what's going to happen when I die, I mean, I'm 37 years old. I'm going to be alive for 125 more years, you know? God willing, maybe, or maybe not, I don't know. So what needs to happen is that we need to integrate or reintegrate life and faith together. We need to come to the place where we're giving Jesus a rehearing and asking Jesus, what's the good news that you came to announce? What's the good news that you came to bring? That means that we're going to have to see Jesus less as a savior that keeps us out of hell, less as someone that liberates us to do whatever we want, and more as someone who teaches us how to live well, right? What did it say? I came that you may have life and life abundantly. I wish someone would have said to Jesus, when? When did you uh, want us to have the abundant life? So that he can get, make it clear for, for people of all ages now. I want you to have the abundant life right now. So we have to see Jesus as teacher. You know, strangely, as Willard points out, we, and, I, and by we I mean Christians, we seem prepared to, uh, to learn to live from almost anyone but Jesus. So for financial information, uh, we'll, we'll turn to the, the latest financial guru. For, for a talk about relationships, maybe Dear Abby or, or Oprah can, can teach us, or Dr. Phil can teach us something about that. When it comes to the cosmos, he mentions 
Carl Sagan. Maybe Carl Sagan can teach me about the cosmos. But we're not ready to go to Jesus to look at Jesus and say, what do you have to say about life? Jesus, what do you have to say about my finances? Jesus, what do you have to say about my job? I'm an engineer, Jesus. Can you, this problem is really difficult, Jesus. Can you help me with that? See, that's, that's the change that has to make. We have to see Jesus, as we'll talk about later on, as the smartest person who ever lived. Now, if I were to ask you, uh, outside of this setting, who's the smartest person who ever lived? Who would you say? If we're being honest, and a few years ago, if I was being honest, oh, Bill Gates, or maybe, maybe Albert Einstein, right? We have to change the way we see and understand Jesus. Nobody holds a candle to this guy. Nobody... I mean, the knowledge that he has about the universe, there's information there that we haven't even approached yet. What Jesus knows about finances, Wall Street would just melt into the ground if he opened his mouth and said one thing. So we have to see him as a teacher that can help us live well, and that's where faith comes in. Because if he knows how to help me live well, then my part is to place my confidence in him, to listen him, to, to listen to him, to obey his voice. And therein I experience the abundant life that he came to bring. In Sharon's class on Wednesday, she, she summarized it perfectly when she, she explained to the class what the word conspiracy originally meant in the Latin. The Latin word for conspire is uh, conspirare which means to breathe the same air. To breathe, that's what a conspiracy is. When people conspire together, they're close enough to breathe the same air. So what's a divine conspiracy? Divine conspiracy is a life with God that is so close that you're breathing the same air. And this, this has an extra meaning to me in these days of the coronavirus, right? Because who do I breathe the same air with? Who do you breathe the same air with right now? Those who, I don't wear a mask at home. I breathe the same air with my family, to those who are closest to me. So salvation, Jesus says, is being so close with God that you're conspiring together. You're breathing the same air. And as you do that, the kind of life he has available for you my goodness. So in order to get to that point, we're going to have to rethink the way we understand God, rethink the way we understand the world that God created. So read chapter 3 in the book, come back next week uh, so that we can discuss. Let us pray.